Welcome back. This is Anatomy and Physiology, Vancouver Community College. I'm your teacher, Maria Morlin. This is part two of chapter one, the history of medicine. We look at the history of medicine because uh, we're interested in the pro progression of discoveries. And our work is always built on the work of previous scientists. Also, um, over time, we've dispelled many of the myths surrounding medicine, and we don't want those recurring in our medical practice. But it's very interesting. Without the use of modern technology, there was still quite a bit discovered in the past. For, uh, but the discoveries were often based on myths as well as observations. The ancient uh, Mesopotamians, for example, um, knowledge of the human body came from preparation of the dead, where at times the organs would be removed so that they wouldn't decompose from the inside out. They also thought that the heart was the center of the body, kind of your advisor of your life, but also the organ that um, pumped not only blood to the body, but tears and saliva and sperm and um, urine. But if you died and went to heaven or the divine place, you would be judged by the weight of your heart against a feather, whether or not you were good enough to be allowed into the land of the gods. In China, there's a long tradition of, of traditional Chinese medicine. It's based on uh, yin and yang, which is a, a cultural, a religious belief of opposites and herbal remedies. Also importantly, it was believed that um, energy, also known as qi, flows through the body in certain channels. And if you have an ailment, it just means that those channels need to be opened. And that's what acupuncture is based on largely. Um, there have been studies of acupuncture where um, there was an effect, but it didn't matter where the needles were put. So it's largely a psychosomatic effect, which is actually quite powerful. But they lead to such kind of crazy naturopathic uh, alternative medicines like homeopathy, which is where a substance is diluted so much that you can't actually detect it. And that is what administ is administered to the individual. And these are expensive things, which are mostly water. Uh, the dilution of this, um, this prescription, for example, is so low that there is not a single molecule of active ingredient in the product. During the time of the ancient Greeks, there was a lot of accumulation of knowledge. I think part of the reason was that, um, at least in the higher society, in Greek society, you really didn't have to work. You had slaves to do all your work for you, to carry the wood and the water. And so there was time to think. And even these days, these days, you might think, we're too busy for that. But it's very valuable to sometimes spend time not doing anything else, but just thinking, even for five minutes or 10 minutes. And you'll find that your creativity comes out that way. So a couple of people to note in this time, Hippocrates, He's considered the father of medicine. Um, he believed there were natural causes of disease, which was a, a large leap. He established a basis for a code of ethics, the Hippocratic Oath. Aristotle, he believed there was natural and supernatural causes of disease. And he, although he was a physician um, and a philosopher, he was also a real biologist and he believed that complex structures were built from simpler, smaller components. And I believe even the coin, or even the term atom was coined during this period. 
which is amazing considering even we can't see atoms very well these days, although there are some uh, contraptions by which we can see them. So the Hippocratic Oath, this is the old one uh, from way back, you know, the, the Roman times, the Greek times, into whatever houses I enter, I will go into them for the benefit of the sick and will abstain from every voluntary act of mischief and corruption. Well, I should hope so. Nowadays, there are Hippocratic Oaths by certain medical colleges, uh, but they're not worded this way. They have some different wording. But it ensures uh, ethical practices. Um, Galen was in the Roman world, and he was uh, an observant person. He produced 500 books and writings on medicine and philosophy. And he would study uh, gladiators, when they were injured. And that's how he got his information. Back then, you couldn't dissect humans either. So much of his information came from pigs and from monkeys or other primates. And so he knew that much of his writing would be overturned in the future when people discovered new things. But in spite of that, his works were uh, they prevailed for 1,500 years. So his works were taken as if they were truth for a very long time. That's largely because of the church. Uh, the church discouraged new knowledge. Uh, um, Galen adopted Aristotle's idea, which was that there are four humors of the body, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. And if you had an ailment, if you had a problem, then those humors must be unbalanced in some way. And that started bloodletting. Bloodletting to balance the humors. And that went on for a very long time. So medieval Europe adopted Galen's writings without question. Uh, the person that did the bloodletting was the barber because the barber had sharp instruments basically and if if you see the um you know the barber <laughs> i'm not drawing it very well but the barber has that um cylinder the turning cylinder the red depicts blood and i don't know what the blue predicts predict uh depicts but uh, maybe it was veins i'm not sure but the white is the the bandages They also adopted the use of leeches to draw blood from the body. And if we are part of the, the class, I, I do show a video on leeches. It's by Nova Science Now. They use leeches nowadays in case of a severed um, finger or toe. When it's reattached, the large vessels can be repaired, but many of the smaller ones cannot. They have to regrow and that takes time. And sometimes the blood accumulates and the, and the finger will get really large and it might be lost. So what leeches are used for, they're attached to the finger and they draw the blood out so that it can't accumulate. Back in the dark ages, uh, sanitation was also abandoned. And the reason for that was it was considered a sin by, uh, by some religions to bathe. That was part of the reason. Um, the Dark Ages were dominated by the church. There were some uh, hospitalia, so uh, dwellings that were there for shelter for pilgrims. And uh, they became places of refuge for persons who were, who were sick and dying. Some classical medical knowledge, in other words, knowledge from the Greeks and the Romans, was preserved in the Muslim world, however. But um, in the Christian world, a lot of the works were burned. They were thought to be her heresy or heretic. Heretic. Other people of note are Avicenna. He studied ancient medicine, but from different areas, Greek, Persian, and Indian and he compiled a canon of medicine in 1025. He included his own experience as well. Um, 
we did adopt the idea that there were four humors of the body, uh, four elements of the earth, and some vital force, a link between the body's uh, spirit and soul. But he developed some also very practical things like uh, treatments, such as clearing airways. He did the first tracheotomies that are known uh, with reeds or tubes of gold. He also found that if you dissolve opium seeds in oil and you drop it near a tooth, that it could help with pain. So enlightenment is an, a period of time um, post-1450 where there was a revival of interest in scientific inquiry, where minds were allowed to uh, explore. Uh, Andreas Vesalius, he displaced much of Galen's work because he started to do uh, cadaver dissections and find out some different things. William Harvey, before his time, it was thought that food was absorbed or food was ingested absorbed. Uh, it went uh, to the heart. The heart pumped it in the blood to the body and it was absorbed by all the tissue. And it was just a one-way thing. Uh, it wasn't circulated. It was an open system. But William Harvey discovered that it was a closed system, a circulatory system. Uh, René Descartes was also a philosopher. He adopted and uh, progressed with the um, idea that the body is made up of smaller and smaller parts which indeed it is. And even at that time, some hospitals and medical schools were established. Uh, with this knowledge and collaboration, um, people could even identify cures for diseases that have been around for quite a long time, like scurvy, for example. When ships went out exploring during those times, sometimes half the crew would die of scurvy. Uh, scurvy, he, he decided citrus fruit, fruit was a cure for, for scurvy, and indeed it is by virtue of a vitamin C. So vitamin C is a coenzyme, as all vitamins are, and this coenzyme is a, a helper of an enzyme that makes collagen. And collagen is instrumental in holding blood vessels together, for example. So uh, if the vitamin C is not there, the enzyme doesn't work, the collagen doesn't hold the blood vessels together, and there's hemorrhaging and eventually a death. Um, another very observant person was Edward Jenner. He noticed that milkmaids uh, that caught cowpox, which is very similar to smallpox, but not exactly the same, he, just, he noticed that they didn't develop smallpox, or very rarely did. And so he thought it must be because they all had already had the cowpox. And he inoculated a boy, turns out it was his infant son, with cowpox, and then unsuccessfully attempted to infect him with smallpox. That vaccine actually worked. Um, it, was, it was safe, um, it became popular, and it did much to reduce smallpox mortality. And if you are at a live lecture, then I would show you a discovery video about Jenner's work. And I will try to upload that, but I'm not sure if it will be successful. Uh, these are some pictures. I just threw this in because I thought they were so interesting. Speaking of drawing, <laughs> these are all drawings or painting of hands. Yes, yeah, so this is a parrot. These are the fingers here. That's the parrot's head. Isn't that interesting? Somebody drew. A tiger, an eagle. So just all painted on somebody's hands. <laughs> it's quite a digression. In the 19th century, uh, Fracastoro suggested diseases were caused by some sort of invisible, he called them seminaria, uh, germs. That was a long time before Pasteur, for example. It was the prevailing view that disease was caused by a kind of a fog in the air is called a miasma. And it could have been because uh, sometimes in the cold and flu season, especially in Britain, uh, there were fogs in the air. Thought that Somebody thought there must be a relationship. And even a study in France of yellow fever, um, not in France, but it was an investigation actually in Barcelona in Spain, 
they thought it proved contagion was not possible because in one place, people had the disease and people caught it kilometers away, hundreds of kilometers away as well. It was thought that because separate populations caught the disease that it couldn't possibly have been transmitted over that distance, but they didn't know about mosquitoes. And mosquitoes indeed is, and mosquitoes are a carrier of diseases as are many other animals. During this time of the Renaissance, um, luckily, sanitation came back into favor. So Semmelweis reduced, reduced deaths um, by insisting that anybody that delivered a baby should wash in chlorinated lime. So what would occur is that doctors would perform autopsies in a hospital and then directly afterwards deliver a baby. And unfortunately that led to the death of, of females. And he observed this and then insisted that um, the doctor should wash their hands in chlorinated lime. And Lister is another person who um, reduce mortality from infections uh, by the use of antiseptics in 1861. So sanitation was coming into practice. The uh, germ theory that disease was caused not by a miasma or some fog in the air, but actually small microscopic unseen germs that we now know are bacteria and viruses and sometimes other protists, eukaryotes, uh, which is what um, malaria is caused by. So he also devised a method for agents to use as vaccines. Uh, Robert Koch, he identified agents of tuberculosis and cholera. Uh, tuberculosis, a disease of the lungs and cholera, which causes a terrible diarrhea and dehydration. And by 1900, that miasmatic theory of, of disease was Totally discredited. We now know the germ theory is the correct theory, of course. Another important person in the history of medicine is Florence Nightingale, uh, considered the founder of the nursing profession. So she lived between 1820 and 1910. Um, there is now a Nightingale, Nightingale School of Nursing and a research foundation in Canada. Uh, she developed methods of patient care that were excellent and also hospital administration. Uh, the Florence Nightingale effect is when a doctor or nurse falls in love with a patient. And that is the end of this section. Thank you very much for watching.